now I'd sort of like to take a little bit of time to sort of talk about um, what we're sort of calling Canada's first center of excellence. So I know uh, Dr. Molson sort of uh, set the tone and highlighted the context in terms of um, how sort of um, these institutions, so for example, Queens and UBC across uh, Canada, sort of their emergency action plans and the, the screening initiatives that have been um, taking place there and sort of how we can translate um, those into the community and take more of a community level perspective towards it. And now I'm going to sort of share a source, sort of some of the work we've been doing um, at Queens with our screening program as, as well as sort of share some of the future directions we have um, for the upcoming years. So once again, um, the well-known figure. So you all know that this is a, the CSCAP, so the Cardiovascular Screening and Care of the Athletes Program. Um, so under this program, a center of excellence um, incorporates all of the elements. So we have our foundational enhancing excellence pillar, as well as our three screening tiers. Um, and the ultimate goal is to link these centers of excellence together. So in order to sort of facilitate a national approach to data gathering and enhancement of quality of evidence. So during the development of these recommendations, um, a trial screening program was implemented at our institution. It was headed by uh, Dr. Amar Jory and then Dr. Um, Molson. And this was in collaboration with uh, Queen's Athletics. I know we have some of our Q Sports med Medicine team here. So uh, Ryan Bennett and Dr. Karen Graham. So they've been sort of essential in terms of helping um, roll out and implement this program to our athletes. Um, so the purpose of our screening program was to outline the successful implementation of the recent cardiovascular pre-participation screening recommendations. And it ultimately served as a practical blueprint for other Canadian institutions or organizations um, intending to implement a formal screening program. So this was originally implemented in 2017 um, as an institutional translation of the joint position statement. And Queen's University met all the requirements to become a center of excellence under the CSCAP. So as you can see um, in the foundational pillar, we um, achieved high quality emergency protocols through accessible AED locations. So that was um, touched on by Dr. Molson, as well as safety protocols, um, athlete guidelines and services. Um, and on our enhanced pillar um, sort of constituted a collaborative sports cardiology network. So we drew expertise from the cardiovascular imaging network at Queens, um, the athletic therapy team, strength and, and conditioning, as well as the Kingston Health Sciences Center. Um, and then our excellence pillar was sort of founded on shared decision making. Uh, so this sort of approach was utilized throughout our screening process. And I'm going to go into a little bit uh, more further detail about that later in this presentation. And then finally, um, we implemented all three screening tiers. Um, so all of our athletes were required to complete an essential history questionnaire, physical exam, and ECG. So in terms of screening workflow, um, the main components of our program um, constituted a general medical and family history questionnaire uh, that was completed by the athlete, as well as a physical examination and 12 lead ECG that are completed and interpreted by um, our primary care partners and networks. Um, our multidisciplinary review procedure involved an administrative assistant that reviewed all of these packages for completeness, um, an athletic therapist who used a binary approach to flagging um, any cases of concern, and then all of these packages were reviewed by our sports physicians, um, who then um, either cleared the athlete or referred them for further testing um, through our cardiology team and our subsequent subspecialties. So over our two-year implementation period, uh, we received 517 packages, um, of which 438 were complete and 114 uh, were flagged. And what was interesting to note is that over 90% of our flagged athletes were for specifically cardiovascular concerns. And of this subset of flagged athletes, there was uh, around 60% that were directly pertaining to the athlete's ECG. Um, so of these flagged cases, um, majority of them were cleared upon review, although 12 were referred for uh, further testing by our cardiology team. And at the end, all of our athletes were eventually uh, cleared um, using this stepwise screening approach. And actually, over this uh, implementation period, we actually had a 
pretty profound and unique case. So we had an 18 year old male rowing athlete um, who is intending to try out for the varsity team. So when he submitted his screening package, um, his history indicated uh, no previous syncope, angina, or shortness of breath, uh, rest and exercise. Um, his physical exam was totally normal, although um, there was an abnormal ventricular pre-excitation pattern that was noted on his ECG. So in given the um, table that was presented in the uh, guidelines, uh, this is from uh, Dr. Sharma, um, we can see that um, a ventricular pre-excitation pattern is under the abnormal ECG findings column, and this sort of warrants further evaluation. And on the athlete's ECG, that was actually picked up and interpreted as, as Wolf Parkinson White. So in terms of our screening detection and management um, process, um, first uh, our, our athlete underwent a binary flagging approach by our athletic therapist. And at this point, the ECG abnormality was detected. So the athlete uh, was then flagged and then referred for a follow-up position by uh, a follow-up appointment by our sports physician. And at this point, our ECG abnormality was confirmed. And then our athlete was then sent to um, our sports cardiology team with a consultation. So at this consultation, what was actually brought up is that, um, and this wasn't originally indicated in the athlete's history, is that um, at this point they were called episodic palpitations during exercise. So this ultimately led to the diagnosis of WPW. And as such, um, a stress test and EP study were ordered to define the risk. So at this point, um, there was a shared decision um, of partial restriction. So the athletes was, was able to sort of continue training at sub-maximal levels. Um, and then eventually they were going to um, sort of, once their stress test and EP study was ordered, there was going to be a consultation um, with our cardiology team. And as you can see throughout this whole sort of shared decision-making process, our decision team involved um, the athlete, his parents, uh, our athletic therapists, sports physicians, and our cardiovascular care team. So in order to define the risk, um, the stress test and EP study integrated a, uh, indicated a short anterograde refractory period of the pathway. Um, and at this point, there was a shared decision by all members of the team to sort of um, support a catheter ablation on the accessory pathway. Um, the pathway was ablated with no complications and the athlete was then subsequently cleared. Um, so given the small risk of um, reoccurrence, it was decided that the athlete was able to ease into regular training and full competition um, with follow-up. So as I sort of outlined, the roles of um, the shared decision-making um, process, specifically in our screening program, was to contextualize the screening process for all involved. Um, it was to inform all parties about the management and treatment associated with um, a particular diagnosis and um, the risk of sudden cardiac death, as well as ensure an informed decision was made in regard to no partial or full restriction. So the three sort of components um, comprised in this shared decision-making approach was a choice awareness, options dialogue, and decision discussion. So as you can see here, um, our process sort of started with a choice awareness. So we made sure that the athlete and his parents were informed um, about um, the screening program and that any abnormalities could be detected. Um, following the identification of um, the red flag, um, there was a discussion of the interventional options with the cardiovascular care team, uh, staff, parents, and the athletes. And then finally, following um, the intervention, there was a decision discussion. So this discussion um, ultimately decided that the um, athlete was able to participate in sport, and this was shared amongst the entire team. So this program ultimately highlights how institutions can employ a stepwise approach to cardiovascular care, uh, beginning with three main pillars, so our foundational, enhanced, and excellence pillars, and then by adding in um, the three unique screening tiers of the history questionnaire, physical exam, and 12-lead ECG. So over the course of this program, we've sort of thought of three main questions that are helping to sort of guide our future directions and pre-participation screening practices in Canada. Um, so under our innovation pillar, we sort of ask, how do we build a Canadian network for the translation of the CISCA? And that's sort of, I guess, one of the main reasons that um, we sort of ask everybody to meet in today. Um, under our education pillar, we ask, how do we improve the health and safety and reduce sudden cardiac death and cardiovascular risk in Canadian athletes? 
And then our outcomes pillar is sort of um, focused on defining the occurrence of cardiovascular disease, outcomes, and risk associated with SCD and Canadian sport. So in terms of next steps and future directions, um, we have sort of redeveloped our local program. Um, so we're looking to sort of implement an online and centralized cardiovascular screening platform in comparison to our paper-based form, as well as validate uh, point of care ultrasound protocols that were sort of established. I know Dr. Molson uh, worked with that on Dr. Jory, with Dr. Jory, as well as um, sort of evaluate our unique ECG um, workflow process, which involves sort of having our ECG completed um, by our primary care networks and then sent into our institution. Um, under our education pillar, um, creating a network of centers of excellence is um, sort of at the core, as well as sort of developing a Canadian specific um, consensus-based history questionnaire, as well as disseminating educational resources and sports specific cardiovascular training. And finally, in our outcomes, um, pillar. Um, we're looking towards national uptake of um, this program and our um, centralized cardiovascular screening platform, which will help facilitate cross-institutional um, data of screening outcomes. So just to reiterate a bit on uh, some of the points that were already brought up um, recently. So it's, it's sort of been, I know some of the, the work by uh, Dr. McKinney and Dr. Molson um, what they sort of noted was that only around 52% of youth sports institutions um, conducted some sort of uh, PPS for their athletes. And of these, the screening practices are highly variable. So when compared to the AHA and ESC guidelines or the PPE form. So despite these variable screening practices, a uh, majority of youth sports institutions um, are actually doing a good job in terms of um, accessible AEDs and then satisfactory emergency action plans. Um, so this um, recent training practice uh, paper coming out of um, BC um, actually showed some interesting points in this topic. Um, so they noted that um, all institutions had an AED present or nearby at all games and that close to 100%, so 94.4% had one present in practice. Although um, from my perspective, it was quite sort of concerning to know that only 66% um, of athletic personnel were actually mandated to have AED and CPR training. So I definitely think there's some room for improvement in that area. So looking towards our goal of a re, um, increasing awareness of these topics and also um, AED and CPR training for athletic personnel, I think this is a very important area, but we're still missing one big component. And that's sort of, what about our athletes? Like, shouldn't we be training them in AED and CPR? Why are we sort of specifically looking at our athletic personnel? So as a student athlete myself, sort of um, as a little story, so I've been involved in sports at Queens for my entire career. I was a rower for uh, my undergrad and now I'm sort of transitioning into triathlon. So I've attended numerous training seminars and completed various um, educational modules to ensure I was up to date and informed with the latest health information, safety protocols, and sporting guidelines. So I completed the Canadian Center for Ethics and Sport, my true sport um, and clean sport testing. I've been given an overview of um, eligibility. I've participated in concussion awareness seminars. Um, I've completed hazing modules and more recently I've sort of been um, shown the implications of cannabis and legalization for student athletes. Although there's one sort of big component that's missing here. So the missing component is mandatory cardiovascular safety, sudden cardiac arrest awareness, and AED and CPA are training for our varsity athletes. So in my personal experience, I've never been required to read up about CPR techniques or AED utilization measures and or learned about cardiovascular awareness uh, in sport. And I think this is, um, I'm probably sort of reiterating some of the um, perspectives from my fellow athletes. Um, so I know Dr. Molson sort of already showed uh, this picture. So um, this is utilizing the pulse point map to uh, map AED locations across the, the Queens campus. And as you can see, our, our institution has placed AEDs within close distances to major sporting fields. Um, and although this is quite a, an amazing uh, safety initiative and it shows that sort of we're procuring and placing our AEDs at unique spots. Um, I question how many student athletes are actually aware of this. 
and it's likely very few, which I think is a substantial safety gap, uh, particularly in terms of athletes helping athletes in the field of play. So overall, although Canadian institutions have been shown to have good emergency action plans and preparedness measures, uh, we should really be focusing education and initiatives for athletes as they're the ones that are um, by the side of their teammates at all points and likely um, to be alongside a victim of one of these cardiovascular outcomes. So the big question is, how do we solve these important problems? So it's why sort of we're all here uh, together uh, today and tomorrow. So given the variable uh, screening practices and lack of athlete um, education and cardiovascular safety, our institution is sort of enlisting the help of an IT solutions company to help create an online screening portal that can be utilized by our athletes. So within this portal, we plan to house our mandatory pre-participation screening program components for athletes, as well as um, cardiovascular safety and in sport education for both athletic personnel as well as our student athletes involved in sport. So in comparison to our paper-based program, this will allow for um, enhanced screening processes and review as well as an in, um, increased workflow and usability within our athletics department. So these improvements will come from various features on this system, uh, including automatic uh, athlete clearance status, uh, flagging process, and an audit trail to help facilitate the shared decision-making process. So as an overarching goal, we hope that we can sort of translate this screening portal to institutions across Canada, um, ultimately resulting in safer athletes participating in sport, uh, educated sports personnel and athletes, and the facilitation of uh, national data pooling for research purposes. So as we have been collaborating with our IT solutions company, we sort of um, put together a preliminary structure and design of the screening portal. Uh, so within this portal, um, each athlete sort of has their own unique account and they're required to complete different components of their screening online. And we've also added in the potential to introduce educational requirements for athletes. So this um, comes in terms of AED and CPR sort of videos and training as well as awareness of sudden cardiac arrest. So as you can actually see on this screenshot, um, our flagged athletes and their clearance status are automatically tracked through this system. So take, for example, uh, Patrick Jones here, um, who is highlighted in red and flagged. So if we take a look at his clearance status, um, we can see that he hasn't completed his SADS education video, his cardiovascular screening questionnaire, or uploaded his uh, signed physical exam. Um, and this has sort of resulted in his um, inability to be cleared to participate in sport. So now that I sort of showed you a brief sort of um, overview of what our program of doing is doing. Um, our next steps are sort of to um, initially trial our preliminary portal at Queen's University until 2021, and then hopefully translate it to other youth sports schools uh, and Canadian academic institutions. And then ultimately um, reaching sort of that institute, uh, that community level, we hope to sort of this will offer the potential to roll out uh, to community sporting um, institutions and organizations and recreational uh, leagues. Although there are some sort of key potential barriers to this. Um, so one of them being a nationwide consensus and agreement, um, as well as sort of leapfrogging and jumping into existing institutional IT infrastructure, as well as the availability of cardiovascular specific expertise um, at different locations. Thank you.